My world-building motto is food and shelter a king. In order to have a culture and a history, people first need to survive. And as I'm out to build a hunter-gatherer culture from scratch, my first question to myself is, what do they eat? When it comes to plants, humans mostly eat either their reproductive parts or the tubers, rhizomes and such. And these are very plentiful in desert climates, where a large percentage of above-ground plant production is edible seeds, and many plants grow large underground tubers as an adaptation to drought. And so we have the foragers of the Kalahari Desert, who gather up to 85% of their food. In tropical forests, plants put a lot of their energy into growing the largely inedible stems and leaves, and fruit grow high up in the canopy and can be hard to reach. So the proportion of gathered food is lower, while hunting and fishing have to compensate. As we move into the more temperate climates, we get groups that compensate for the lower returns from gathering with a lot of fishing. And if they are stuck in land, and all the horticulturalists around for trading with, we have groups that have large territories and hunt a lot of game. Once we get to the Arctic, there's an enormous reliance on hunting and fishing, with gathering going down all the way to 0% in a few cases. But if you are creating your own imaginary foragers and want to have an analogy to a concrete group of hunter-gatherers, rather than simply relying on a general rule, then I recommend this book, which has all the data. But in order to use that data, you have to calculate the effective temperature and the primary production of the area inhabited by your hunter-gatherers. Here is the equation for calculating the effective temperature. I have plugged in the numbers for the area I'm working with, and here is my ET. This is the equation for calculating the primary production of an area. E stands for evapotranspiration, and calculating it is a complex matter. But for my river basin, there's a very good real-world analogy, the Sichuan Basin. So I have plugged in the data from Sichuan into the calculation, and here is the result. The numbers I got put me the closest to these forager groups, Kaingang, Aweikoma, and Hadza. But my imaginary hunter-gatherers inhabit this strip of land along a large river, so I will have them fish a bit more than one would expect. And one might assume that hunter-gatherers harvest all the edible things they can find, but that's not really the case. Let's say we have a forager. Today he is foraging on this hill, and it has these edible resources available – lizards, big starchy tubers, and herbs. Lizards take 30 minutes to find, 10 minutes to harvest and process, and each provide around 700 calories. Large tubers take 20 minutes to find, 20 minutes to dig up, and provide around 600 calories. While the edible herbs take 10 minutes to find, 40 minutes to harvest a basketful of them, and that basketful amounts to 400 calories total. Lizards have the best post-encounter return rate of the three, 10 minutes of handling time and 700 calories, which is 70 calories per minute. If all our forager harvests on that hill is lizards, then his overall return rate, the one with search time included, will be 17.5 calories per minute. And if he also harvests the tubers, his overall return rate will go up to 21.6 calories per minute. But harvesting the herbs is simply not worth it. The post-encounter rate is only 10 calories per minute, and the overall return rate with the herbs is lower than the one without them. Our forager will have wasted his time harvesting the herbs, when he could have spent that time harvesting more tubers and lizards. So even though the herbs take the least time to find, our forager will ignore them, unless the resources with the higher return rates start getting depleted and more time-consuming to find. Then the overall return rate with the herbs included will be higher than the one without them except that our forager will go find some overhill to forage on long before whatever even happens. Hunter-gatherers continue foraging on the same patch of land, only for as long as it is worth their while. But before I create a whole menu for my forager, there's a few more things to note. A high rate of return is not always enough to convince people to eat something. Some foragers just don't eat grub. 
but there is one resource that is highly valued by hunter-gatherers the globe over – fatty meat. Even those foragers who have plant food make up the majority of their diet complain of meat hunger when there is no meat in camp. One obvious reason for that is the fact that meat contains the nine essential amino acids, which humans have to obtain from their diet in order to not suffer from protein energy malnutrition. And it has to be fatty meat rather than just any meat. Animals that have little body fat are often thought of as secondary resources or even starvation food. Consuming large amounts of lean meat can lead to protein poisoning, and a diet that is high in protein but low in fat and carbohydrates can lead the body to burning the protein for energy, which can then lead to a protein deficiency. Those things are not as much of a problem in the diets of agricultural people, but you will never find a vegetarian forager. Hunter-gatherers the world over have a craving for fatty food, so fatty meat will always be the number one item on any forager's menu. And some of that meat can also be traded for carbohydrates if an agricultural village is nearby, though my hunter-gatherers mostly trade animal furs and skins rather than the meat itself. And so the most prized foods on the menu of my foragers are the large aquatic mammals that have plenty of blubber and the wild pigs that live in the hills. And the second most prized are deer. Then there are the various smaller aquatic mammals. Then snakes, lizards and fish. Then birds, honey and tubers. And then monkeys, berries, fruit and nuts and cereal grains obtained for trade. Going with the proportions I established earlier, here's how it all figures in the diet. But getting back to that motto from the start of the episode, hunter-gatherers are famous for having simple shelters, which they can pack up anytime they need, and then set off in search of a better place to forage. So join me in the next episode, where I will figure out how my imaginary foragers move around the area they inhabit. Thank you.